Welcome to our revision for managerial economics, where we're predominantly going to look at four key topics, demand theory, theory of supply. Uh, we also look at elasticity, then also consumer behavior. Now, everything hinges around principle of demand. The law of demand simply stipulates that for any normal good, the higher the price, the lower the quantity demanded. The higher the price, the lower the quantity demanded. Now, dealing with demand, you must understand that demand is merely, it's not merely a desire or a want. It has two things. You have the ability and the willingness to purchase a particular commodity. So once you have these two, ability and willingness, within a predetermined period of time, then we call it demand. <clears throat> Market, at the same, on the other hand, is not a physical place per se. It is simply a virtual place where trade can occur. Buyers and sellers will interact. It could be a virtual platform like you and I right now. It's a market for a service that you're getting. And so the number of determinants of demand that one must get to know. So the determinants of demand formulate what we call a demand function. This demand function has what we call the dependent variables and the independent variables. So we're going to use logic. Okay. So we have a number of factors that affect demand. We have what we call the price of the particular good. We have what we call the price of a complement. We have what we call the price of a substitute. We have what we call advertising, income, test, technology, and other factors that are uh, explained. Now, this is what we call a demand schedule. So we have what we call the dependent variables and the independent variables. The dependent and the independent variables. So if we're dealing with an X or Y plane, our quantity demanded is usually here and the price is usually on the Y axis. Now please listen to me very carefully because everything that I'm going to mention here is examinable. So, the dependent variables and the independent variables make up the demand schedule. So the result and the input are the relationship you need to understand between the demand and the input. So demand and the factors that affect demand here are the relationship that we're going to establish. So I need you by the end of this, be able to identify which one is dependent of each. So price is one of the factors that affects demand, except that only price, if the changes are made on price, the movement will be along the demand curve. So the demand curve is always down sloping because of the law of demand, which stipulates that for any normal good, the price will increase from P1 to P2. If the price increases from P1 to P2, the quantity demanded will decrease from Q1 to Q2. So this is uh, the law of demand. It has a negative relationship because of the law. You and I must agree by now to say, for any commodity whose price is high, you demand less of it. And the demand equation is usually given as follows, P is equal to A minus BQ.
and this is what causes our um, elasticity to always be negative because there is an inverse relationship that exists. Are we following? Yes. All right. Should I lose any one of you? Please feel free to ask. I'm teaching like I'm teaching a BID class completely. Okay. So BID means brought in dead. So I'm teaching like you literally don't know anything. So this is how our invest demand function looks like. It's called an invest demand because our price is the subject of a formula. So this is the invest demand. Okay, so we proceed. So we have looked at price. There are other factors that affect demand also. These are the related commodities. Now in the related commodities, we have two. We have what we call subsidy goods and complements. A subsidy good is simply a good which is used with equal ease. For instance, subsidy good could be ball pen and ink pen, tea and coffee. Now for all subsidy goods, they have what we call a positive relationship. And as such, the elasticity of demand is always positive. Why is a relationship positive? Because for any good between stachanical and fresh you, if the price of stachanical goes up, it means the demand for fresh you go up. So they have a positive relationship. The price of one going, a competitor going up is an advantage to the other. So there's a positive relationship. Complements, on the other hand, are goods which move hand in hand. Their usage is dependent on the availability of both. Without one, the other is absolutely useless. And so, you're using a pen and ink. If there's no ink, the pen becomes useless. Car and petrol. So these ones have an inverse relationship <clears throat> in the sense that the price of a car goes up, the demand for fuel will also go down. So this is opposing each other. It's an inverse relationship. Quick, can you remember what have we said? We have said that there are a number of goods that we have discussed so far. So price, first of all, is the first factor that affects demand. And this price, when there are changes in the price, the movement will be along the demand curve to move from point A to point B. And we've also said that there are two related goods that we've talked about. We have talked about a substitute good. A substitute good is a good which is a competing good. So if you have a positive elasticity of demand, we call that a substitute good. If we have a negative elasticity of demand, we call that a complement. All right. Other factors that affect demand could be what? Um, income. Now, the price of a good, I've already established it, that it causes a movement along this curve. But other factors like other related goods will cause a shift in the demand curve. So related goods, we've talked about a complementary good and the substitute good. Complementary good and the substitute good. Then we go to another factor that affects our um, demand. It's the income of the consumers. So income ideally must always have a positive relationship. Income must always have a positive relationship. Otherwise, it is an inferior good. So what this means is this, income, <clears throat> as it increases, the demand for that commodity must increase. 
and there are two normal goods under income. We have what we call necessities and what we call comforts or luxury goods. So once your income goes up, this must increase as well. Your need for shelter, you want to increase a better housing facility. These are basic necessities. You want to improve the type of a car. So all these have a positive relationship. So these are called what? No more goods. If we get a negative, we call them what? Inferior goods. Inferior goods are goods whose demand will go down as what? As income goes up, they have an inverse relationship. Inverse means opposite. At what point can we consume less of a good when our income goes up? It is when we can afford better. For instance, second-hand clothes, or sort, and um, a train. We go for a plane or a bus because we can afford better. Are we moving together so far? Yes, we are. This is the only course that you can enjoy and apply with logic. You can't guess, you don't know, you don't know. So I've talked about the third factor that affects demand, which is income. Income is denoted by three letters, letter I, letter Y, letter M. Don't get confused. And if our income has a negative relationship, we call that an inferior good. If income has a positive relationship, we call that what? A normal good. Could you more? Yes, we are. All right. Now, these are the three key goods that I'm going to be very much keen on. So, we also have the concept of elasticity. Elasticity is simply a sensitivity that exists due to changes in what? In demand. We have three types of elasticity. We have what we call price elasticity of demand. We have what we call gross price elasticity of demand. We have what we call income elasticity of demand. Now notice that all these have a similar formula. This percentage change in what? Quantity demanded of a percentage change in price. This is called price elasticity of demand. This one is percentage change in what? Quantity of X of a percentage change in what? Price of the other good Y. Then this one is percentage change in what? Quantity or percentage change in what? In income. So they all have a similar pattern. So let me start with price. Price, elasticity of demand, PED. Now, demand can come in the form of an invest demand when P is subject of a formula. The formula for elasticity of demand can be 1 over B times price over quantity. All right, or generally, we know that percentage change in quantity over percentage change in price is simply given by Q2 minus Q1 over Q1 divided by Q2, P2 minus P1 over P1. These are changes. So the P is subject of the formula. Na papata, we call this the invest demand. The Q is subject of the formula. It's called the direct demand. It's more finish. If you are confused, you can just make the other subject of formula. If you want, but I'm just trying to simplify this as much. So elasticity of demand here becomes B times price over quantity. 
what's the difference Q subject? So B, the equity one over. One over means inverse. It only applies on the inverse demand. Now, last of demand, yeah, we put that There's negative one. Let me put negative two, negative one, and zero. When it's between here, it is called inelastic. Remember, inelastic is anything starting with a zero point something. If it's exactly at one, it is unit elastic, not unitary. You need elastic. If you're using one word, it is unitary. Okay. If it's more than one, it is called elastic. All right. So help me now. Negative one, negative two, negative zero point four, negative one point one one. Negative zero point two, negative four. So we have four quadrants here A, B, C, D, E, F. Six quadrants. Which ones are inelastic, predatory, and elastic? A is what? So, a, a is unitary. B? Elastic. It's elastic. C? Elastic. D? Elastic. Uh, inelastic. Elastic. E? Inelastic. Inelastic. F? Elastic. 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 Have a shared anyways. So it's great is zero point something. Whatever has a zero point something is inelastic. If it's above one, it's elastic. If it's exactly one, it is unit elastic. I have a question. So it doesn't matter if it has a negative. It's still elastic if it's uh, more than one. If it's not a negative, it's not demand elasticity. Demand always has a negative elasticity. So all these are negative. You can get a positive for elasticity of demand. Okay. Thanks. All right. Any other questions? <clears throat> All right, so the price of rice has, Zero. has increased from 10 kwacha to 20 kwacha. And the demand has decreased from uh, 50 units. Now people are demanding 30 units. I create the elasticity of demand. Who remembers the formula if you're given units like that? So demand is what? Q2 minus Q1 over Q1. Uh-huh. Divided by P1, P2 over, I mean, P2 minus P1 divided by P1. Excellent. So let's substitute. Thirty minus 50 over what? 50 divided by what? 50 and 10 minus 20. So calculate. 
Un job here. Found him again. One time. Okay. On top there, you found what? Negative what? This is negative 20 over 50, which is what? Negative 0 0.4. 0 0.4. Mm -hmm. And here. Negative 1. Or positive one. It's positive one, yeah. And the final answer will be negative zero point what? Zero point four. Yes. What is our comment here? It's inelastic. Elastic. It is inelastic. All right. Okay. So quickly, let me rush to. Gross price elasticity of demand. Gross price elasticity of demand is simply the percentage change in what? Quantity of X over percentage change in what? Price of Y. So gross price elasticity really looks at the aspect of you determining your demand for a particular commodity due to changes in the price of another commodity. For instance, you want to buy cornflakes. You want to ask how much is milk. These two goods are complements. If milk is too expensive, you not even buy cornflakes. So if you get a negative cross price elasticity, what does it mean? Negative means what? The goods are complements. Mm -hmm. If you get a positive, it means the goods are substitute. Okay. So when we went to income elasticity, we also talked about the same to say a negative means inferior good and a positive means what? A normal good. Except that from the normal good, if it's more than one elasticity, it's a luxury. If it's between zero and one, it is a necessity. Okay. So before I proceed, I'll do a quick, can you remember? So we've said that um, under income elasticity, consumers who should usually buy less of a good when your income goes up because it's an inferior good. If they buy more of that good, it is no more good, all right? Then we've said that a marketplace is not a physical place where goods are sold. It can be virtual. We need to have uh, goods and services being sought. I've also mentioned to say that when you are dealing with inverse relationship, it means price and quantity are not moving in the same direction. They're opposing each other. When one is going up, the other one is going down. Then we also say that if we're changing factors that affect demand, besides price, it will cause a shift in the demand curve. But if it's affecting price, it will cause a movement along the demand curve. So we've talked about factors that affect demand. There are about 12. If it's price, it will move along. If it's test, if it's income, if it's uh, advertising, if it's uh, population, technology, these are shifts. Okay. I've also made mention to say that if demand is elastic, what does that mean? To increase the sales volume, the firm should do what? Should reduce the price. That's what means to be elastic. Elastic means to be sensitive. Then I've given you the demand function to say demand function is given by what? P is equal to A minus B, BQ. This is a negative relationship. If it's supply, supply is given by A plus BQ. Supply looks like that. It's called a positive slope. All right. So can I proceed from what I talked about so far? Any questions?
So I've also mentioned to say that cross price elasticity becomes negative if the two products are what? Uh, complements. It becomes positive if the, if the two products are what? Substitute. Then we've also defined that if we to, to derive that demand for a product, it means that demand depends on what? On the um, demand other than the products. That's what we call drive demand. Then economics or managerial economics by definition is simply a science that brings together what? Two things. We have economic theory, which has two components, micro and what? Macro. You need to know the definition of managerial economics. It brings in two things, micro and macro. It also brings in decision sciences, which include what? Econometrics and what? Mathematical analysis. When it brings these two guys together, they'll solve a managerial problem optimally. So this is what we call managerial economics. So there's optimization, that's why I teach you calculus. So you need to know the definition of managerial economics. So in the demand equation, you, that I've just shown you behind here, the B stands for the what? The slope. If we have A minus BQ, B is the gradient of the slope. A stands for the y-intercept, where it's cutting the p-axis. An intercept is simply a point or a cutting point. So if our demand equation is 10 minus 2Q, means that it's going to cut here at 10, starting from 10 there. Then the slope here is what? Negative 2. That's what it means that this is a slope. All right. So I've also mentioned to say that income elasticity simply means that every 1% of the income that increases, your demand will increase by the same percentage, by the gradient's percentage. And demand, when we're dealing with demand, it simply refers to the quantities that people are willing and are able to pay for at particular prices. Okay. So now I want to go to another topic just interlinked. It is about um, equilibrium. I want to go to equilibrium. If equilibrium. Are there any questions here? I'm discussing five topics in one session in 30 minutes or now. So please bear with me. I can't stick that one topic the whole, uh, a whole one hour. All right. So if you have a demand function, which is 100, minus 2q. I want to teach you how to illustrate this demand function using the Collings way. Bring the letters on one side. All right. There's an invisible one there. Divide one into 100, it is 100. There's a two there before the q. These two came this side, became a positive. So two into 100, it is positive 50. So we know that P is here and Q is there and demand is down sloping. So it is cutting the P at 100 and the Q it is cutting it as what? At 50. So this is how we draw the demand function. Who wants to try? If we had our P as 10, minus 0.5 Q. 
what do we do to sketch this? So you put the letters on one side, mm -hmm. then you divide. So there's an invisible one there. One into 10 is 10. 0 0.5 Q in there, it will be 20. So to cut our P at what? At 10. And to cut our Q at what? 20. Okay, how together? So if we're dealing with a supply function, same application of 10 plus 0.5 Q. So this one on goes aside, it will be P minus 0.5 Q is equal to 10. What number is before P? It is a one. So one into 10, you put a 10 there. What number is before Q? Negative 0 0.5. Negative 0 0.5 into 10, negative 20. So to cut here, negative 20. To cut here, at what? Positive 10. All right. <clears throat> so a point at which demand and supply meet is called equilibrium. So equilibrium is simply a point at which the consumer is willing and able to pay. The supply is also willing and able to supply. Unanimously, these must agree. The consumer has a rational behavior, always wanting a lower price for more goods, whereas the supplier always wants a higher price for less goods. These two must unanimously agree. This is called a point of equilibrium. The area here below the demand function is called our consumer surplus. And the area below above the supply function is called the producer surplus. So when we add these two guys, what we get is called the total surplus or the social welfare. Social welfare is when we add the consumer surplus and the producer surplus. Now these are just triangles. And from our grade three, the area of a triangle is given by what? Half times base times height. That is how we calculate the area of a triangle. So if you're given the price function as 100 minus 2Q, and you're given the supply as 10 plus 3Q, even without being told which one is the supply, you're able to tell from the signs that this guy is demand and this guy is supply. So at equilibrium, we know that demand must be equal to supply. So what is our demand function? 100 minus 2Q. You notice our supply function? 10 plus 3Q. So when the 10 comes inside, it will subtract from the 100. And when the 2 goes inside, it will add. So we are going to have 90 is equal to 5Q. So when you divide both sides by 5, our Q is therefore going to be 18. So 18 is called our equilibrium quantity. So you can substitute the quantity into any of these ones here. If you put 18 here, you put 18 there. Our equilibrium price will be 64. So how do we sketch this? Put the letters on one side and there. So when you do your down sloping, up sloping, it will cut the demand function at 100. It will cut the supply function at 10. The equilibrium is at 64 here and here. Our equilibrium quantity was at 18. We know that quantity is here. So the inverse demand is very easy to plot because if you have gradients, you just get the figures there. But if you want to use the good one way, 
I repeat, 100 minus what? Two kilo. So when you put the letters on one side, we're going to have what? 100 this side. We have a one. One into 100, it's 100. Two into 100, it's 50. So our demand function will cut at 100 on the P axis and what 50 on the Q axis. Then we had our supply as 10 minus 3 Q. Put the letters on one side. So here we're going to have number one into 10 is 10. So we put our 10 there. And uh, negative, uh, this was positive. So when you go to the side, it will be negative. So negative um, <clears throat> 3 into 10 is negative 3.33. We never consider negative quantities, so just leave it like that. Remember, our quantity was what? 18, and our price was 64. Have I lost anyone here on the sketching? Are we following? Yes, just below on the negative part. Um, okay. I think at the first time you said that um, when you are changing here. the yeah when you are changing um, the ten plus three q, it has to become negative. So this three so at first this was what it was positive three. So when it goes aside, it will be negative three. Okay. It's a supply. okay. Okay, all right, that's fine. So which one is the consumer surplus? X or Y? X is the consumer surplus, this area here. So we get the distance from here to here is 36. 36. From here to here is 18. Consumer surplus is half BH. So half of 18 against 36, you get your consumer surplus. All right, how do you get? I don't have a calculator, so the quicker you. So we have done half, uh, is it half which is 0 0.5 times 18, and mm -hmm. that is, we should also multiply by 36. Yeah, so 18 times 18 in short. 324. 324. 324. Made for our font 324. Then we we'll go to this triangle Y. This is still 18. From here to here, it's 54. So producer surplus is half BH. So base is 18, the height is 54. So half of 18 is nine, nine times 54. What do we get? 487. Four, eight what? So when you add all these, you get your social welfare, which is what? 810. All right. So let's try. Suppose our demand is given and our supply is given as follows. So demand here, 220 minus 200p. And we are given um, 800 plus 700 P. Who wants to try to lead us through? How do we find the equilibrium price and quantity?
at the at the equilibrium, what happens? Demand is what to supply, right? Yes. Yeah. Demand is demanded and supplied. So what is we have two thousand two hundred minus what? Mm -hmm. P should be what? Two hundred. Eight hundred. Eight hundred. Plus what? Plus five hundred. P. So what do we do? Plus five hundred P. Like times to get. Okay, two thousand two hundred minus eight hundred. Should be got what? Two hundred P. Mm -hmm. Plus five hundred P. So what do we have here? Okay. One thousand two hundred. Fourteen hundred. Then here. 700. So what we have, our P is got what? 2. And our Q is got what? We substitute in any of these ones here. 800 plus 500. So where this P we put a what? A 2. So we're going to have 8,000, 1,800. Is that clear? Yeah. Are we together? Yes, we are. All right. So we could also have a multilinear demand function, which could be given as follows. 10 minus 2 px plus 3 py plus 5m. We are told that the price of x is one quarter, price of y, two quarter, the income, four quarter. Number one, to create the quantity demanded. Just substitute the values there. So where there's Px, you put one. Where there's Py, you put what? Two. Where there's M, what do you put? Four. We have 10 minus two plus six plus what? 20. All right, together. So here we're going to have 34. As a demanded. And they ask you to find the price elasticity of demand. So elasticity of demand, this is a direct demand, just to the, the gradient for demand of a price of X times quantity of X. This is called on price elasticity of demand because we're dealing with the same what? Commodity, good X against good X. So when you go into this function here, let's identify the three slopes there. There's a slope for good X, which is what? Negative two. There's a slope for good Y, which is what? Positive three. There's also a slope for income, which is what? Positive five. All these are slopes, the numbers here. How to get? So what is a slope for good X? Negative two. And the price for good X is one over the quantity of X we've just calculated as 34. So this is negative two over 34. What do we get? Negative zero point what? Negative zero point zero five eight. Zero five eight, correct. Then we go to elasticity x y, meaning it's crossing from good x to good y. So we're going to get the slope for good y times our price for good y over quantity for good x. So it's crossing from 
good y to put x. So what is slope of y? Positive three. Three, positive three. And what is the price for good y? Two. And the quantity is what? 34. So we divide three times, put the one there, three times two, six. One oh. times 34, 34. So when you multiply, divide six over 34, what do we get? 0.176. So since we're interested in the sign, since the positive sign, cross price elasticity, let's start with the demand elasticity. Demand elasticity, you comment it in either three terms. It is inelastic, unit elastic, or elastic. So this one is inelastic. For cross price elasticity, you comment it in terms of what? A substitute good or a complement? If it's a positive answer, what is it? What type of a good is it? Substitute. The positive is a substitute. So negative is a complement. So this is a substitute. So we're able to tell. So it's a substitute. I can also tell you that from here, if the signs are opposing each other, these are competing each other there. Yeah? Substitute. If there's negative here, negative, they are complements. You can also tell from that. All right. Let's finally go to this one here, income. What we should know is that when the income elasticity is positive, it's a normal good. It's negative, it's an inferior good. All right. Remember from our lesson. Do we remember? We do, right? All right. So let's go now. Income elasticity. So the gradient for the income times the income itself over the quantity. So the gradient for the income is what? Five. The income itself, five over 34. So here we're going to get 25 over 34. What do we get? Positive 0 point something. Positive 0 0.735. 0.735. So this one still gives us a positive, so it means it's a normal good. So before I stuff you with a lot, let's go to the test and do a quick, can you remember? Please don't embarrass me. I've explained quite a lot in one hour. Okay. So we're going to the test. I know the answers are beamed, but also relates to what I have already mentioned initially. So let's go through our tests. Inferior goods are goods where consumers buy less of the good when the income increases. Is that true or false? It is true. We buy less of them when our income increases. We call that what? The income effect. So what is the opposite for inferior goods? Normal goods. Normal goods, correct. A marketplace is a place where goods are sold. It's false. Why was this answer false? It's not a fixed place. It's not a fixed place. Yeah. Good. All right. The inverse relationship means price and quantity will move in the same direction. It is false. Why is this false? Inverse means moving in opposite directions. Excellent. Inverse means opposite or opposing each other. Decision making involves a number of steps. There's problem perception, definition of objectives, examination of constraints, identification of strategies, evaluation of strategies, and determination of the criteria for choosing among strategies. So that is true. Now, a change in the factor that affects a change in a factor that affects demand other than price will cause a shift in the demand curve. Why is this true? Because a change in uh, a, a change in price will only cause a movement along the demand curve. Excellent. I'm proud of you, Brian. 
he was very attentive. So I succinctly mentioned to say along is only on the price aspect. Any other, it is called a shift and I illustrated that. All right. Number six, demand is elastic. The volume of a firm. If demand is elastic, to increase sales volume of a firm should increase the quantity sold. Why is this false? Because we can only increase the sales volume when we decrease the price. So it has nothing to do with it. This is not true. All right. Then we go to um, number seven, the interpretation of the coefficient B on the demand function, A is equal to A plus BP for every unit uh, quantity increases. The quantity demanded will rise by B units. Of course, this um, was not a well-framed uh, question because demand should always have a negative there. But of course, that is what it means that the coefficient here, this is actually a supply function. It means for every unit price increase, the quantity demanded will increase by B units. So you see where the error in this question is in the sense that demand and price have an inverse relationship. It never occurs like this. But for the sake of um, the question, I chose true because that's what it means there. All right, are we following together? Yes, we are. So when price increases from 4,000 to 6,000, the demand reduces from 100 to 700. So in this case, price has to, is declared to be inelastic. Is that true or false? So you cannot ascertain true or false unless you calculate. Remember the formula? Mali, what formula do we use here? Q1, Q2 minus one. Q1. Minus Q1 over, over Q1. Q1. Yeah. Divided by P2. P2 minus P1. Divided by P1. All right. So if the answer that we get here, for instance, is um, negative 1.67, is this elastic or inelastic? This is... Elastic. 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 So, anyway, the concept is calculate it and comment whether it's elastic or inelastic. If cross price elasticity of demand is negative, it means the goods are substitutes. Is it true or false? Why is the answer false? Why is the answer false? Because, yeah, so, because substitute goods have a positive relationship. Yes, because negative only applies for complements. Or like you've said, substitutes have a positive relationship. Great. Derived demand for a product means that the demand depends on the demand for other products. Is it true? Yes. So when you're deriving demand, it means it is dependent on those eh, factors. That's why it's called derived. All right. A branch of microeconomics, which the branch, the main branch of microeconomic theory, which manager economics is related to, is what? Micro. 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 Can someone define managerial economics? Uh, managerial economics is... Uh, yeah. Managerial economics refers to what? The application of what? Two things. Uh, principles, principles and tools. Economic theory. And tools. And tools. 
Economic theory and what? Decision science. Decision. Uh -huh. So under economic theory, there are two things. What are they? Economic I theory and decision macro. science. Two. Micro and macro. Micro and macroeconomics, correct. One of which has already been explained there. And then the decision sciences are two things, which are they? Econometric and uh, uh, mathematical Analy analysis. Excellent. So under decision sciences, we have econometrics and yeah. The two variable case, demand can be expressed in a linear form, A plus BP. The coefficient B represents what? Slope. The slope or the gradient, correct. Okay. Anyway, maybe this is why they're getting it a positive. They're assuming that demand always has a negative what? A negative uh, slope. So maybe in the context of these solutions, maybe I may not create an error because we did it again. It's repeating this. But look, anyway, in a two variable case, demand can be expressed in the linear form q is equal to a plus bp the variable q represents what the dependent how about the variable p represents what the independent. independent so demand depends on the price so elasticity income elasticity of demand means that for every one percent increase in income the quantity demanded will raise by C percent. So that is what we call income elasticity. Now, if they what they put here was one percent increase in the price of another good, the quantity demanded will raise for another good by C percent. What type of elasticity is that? What's elasticity? Try again. 1% increase in one good will cause the one demanded to increase by C percent in the other good. What kind of elasticity is that? Cross. Cross, exactly. Because there are two goods involved. I have said it. So you said I should say it. <laughs> or maybe I didn't hear you clearly. I thought you just said price elasticity of demand. You said cross? Cross, yes. I said cross elasticity. Awesome. Then demand refers to as quantities that people are able to and willing to buy at various prices in a given time. That is what we call demand. What effect occurs when the price of a good falls, the real income of the consumers increases. That is what we call the income effect. So income effect comes about enabling your purchasing power to be higher. So when the price of fuel, as it has gone down, it is able to afford many Zambians transportation, reduction in goods and services, we call that the income effect. Okay. Right. Then when we add the consumer surplus and the producer surplus, what do we call the total? Social affairs. Yeah, that name for social affairs, what? Total surplus. Total surplus, good. What's your other name, Ngosa? I like your participation. It's very good. Thomas. Thomas, all right. It's got the total surplus, it's the same thing. All right, so when we have elasticity at 1.05, is this elastic, inelastic, or unit? Sorry, Collins, we jumped one question before social Oh, okay. okay. So there's what we call government intervention, which occurs when government wants to protect the black market from exploitation. So according to our equilibrium, this is E. So the maximum price that the government can set beyond which so consumers must not sell is called a price seal. Price ceiling is a maximum price that the consumer must what? 
total charge above. Again, we have what we call a flow price. There's a price below which consumers must not what by gain for. So these ones will cause a disequilibrium in the market, which will bring in what? These new triangles, which we call the dead weight loss. So this is under government interventions. So Dash is a maximum price policy to help what? Consumers, it's called price sales. Now I'll ask you, what is the minimum price that will produce protect the producers the price flow it's the flow price correct i'm trying to help you understand this in case it twists the questions in there so it's a flow price correct now the disequilibrium that is caused due to the price that the government innovations mm -hmm. like price ceiling and flow price results into what we call what a disequilibrium that occurs due to government interventions, due to the introduction of price seals and flow prices, brings about what is called. Just from mentioning okay. the dead weight losses, brings about what we call the dead weight loss. So this is the dead weight loss, the new triangles, X and Y. All right. It's already 20, 27. Seven minutes past my time. I should be concluding just now. Um, yes, ma'am. Yes, please. Uh, the... Um... The, the, the ceiling, both of them, the, the, the price ceiling and the floor ceiling, you're explaining them in terms of the consumer. You explain them in terms of both the consumer and the government interventions. So sometimes there's what we call the black market where government says, no, 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 no. These prices are high. These uh, producers want to exploit the consumers. So the government will say, don't charge above this price. So we call that a price. It's like a, a ceiling in the house. It is a seal that government puts to say, don't charge. So this is to protect what? Consumers. Also consumers, sometimes you and I are very exploitive. Somebody is selling in the market, they're selling tomatoes because they are stuck. You want to bring them low. The boss, the shop of 15 quart. I said, I'm going to 15 quart. But they were ordering a 12 quart. So government also come in to protect the producers. So this is called a flow price, price below which you must not bargain. So these are government innovations. Is that clear? Thank you. It's clear. All right. So. <clears throat> Any other questions? All right, thank you so much for the time. I hope I have made a lot of difference to those of you who were really behind. Unfortunately, we time will allow. We still have more questions down there. Yes, Looks like a bit continue. Is it okay if you can share a copy? Uh, no, I can't share this copy. I can only share the recording in the test group. All right.